Last night in Soho from a hotel room, I said I was going to cover this in detail once it was available digitally, and boom, it's available digitally. Go watch Last Night in Soho. So this is a very interesting movie that I don't want to describe in detail, so if you haven't already seen it, I would definitely recommend going and watching it because we're going to be going full spoilers here. So if you had any interest in this story and don't want it ruined and just kind of want the authentic experience, I would just go watch that first then come back. Like, I know this movie isn't gonna hit for everyone, but I am super down for the ideas it explored. So the most basic way I can describe this story without giving too much away is that Thomas and Mackenzie's character is obsessed with the 60s, the music, the fashion, the aesthetic. So when she gets the chance to move to London to attend fashion school, the lines start blurring between the past and the present where the world she idolized isn't as glamorous as it originally seemed. I think so much of this movie is stunning, particularly like the first couple of acts. And then it does get a little bit rough in the way that it executes its conclusion in terms of like a horror trippy style story, but I still enjoy what it was going for, which I'll explain as we go. Overall, I do recommend it. If you're a fan of Edgar Wright's work, this is going to feel completely different from anything else that he's done before. But there's still obviously moments where he shines through in the music, the choreography, and the editing. Specifically the scene where Thomas McKenzie, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Matt Smith are all dancing. It's just, it's so very cool. But I love Edgar Wright's appreciation for fine cinema, and now you can appreciate fine cinema too with today's sponsor, Sundance Now. Sundance Now is an ad-free stream service that offers thousands of hours of the best movies and bingeable shows, including exclusives from around the world that you won't find anywhere else for only $5.99. They also offer the best selection of true crime drama and thrillers. I recently binged my way through Too Close based on the novel by Natalie Daniels, and like reading the description, I just got the vibe that it was like how the Joker behaved with Harley Quinn when he was in Arkham, except probably without the romance aspect, and honestly, little bit. It follows a psychiatrist named Emma who's tasked with assessing a young mother named Connie who's been accused of a terrible crime crime to try to figure out if she should be locked up or rehabilitated. But the longer the sessions go, the more Connie seems to flip them on Emma, turning every interaction into a game where Connie seems to increasingly come out on top. It's a super quick binge, it doesn't waste any time with unnecessary details, and it'll keep you hooked with every new reveal as the mystery unfolds. And if you somehow make it through all the series, Sundance Now also has a selection of some of my all-time favorite movies like Shoplifters and Whiplash. And you can stream Sundance Now anywhere you want across all your favorite devices, either by downloading the app or using your favorite streaming device like a Roku or Chromecast. So start streaming your next obsession today and try Sundance Now free for 30 days by heading on over to SundanceNow.com and using promo code JEDI. So Edgar Wright is one of my favorite directors. I've had a Scott Pilgrim video uh, in the works for a very long time, and that is probably one of my favorite movies. It's just so full of energy. The editing is so unique and fun, and it's definitely that editing that makes his movies so fun and dynamic and just full of energy, and I'm glad that some of it was able to carry over into Last Night in Soho. And don't get me started on the Baby Driver music beat editing or do. I'd love to talk about it. And while Last Night in Soho doesn't hit as hard, I'm definitely a fan of what it swung for, and I can't wait to get into it. As mentioned, this movie is actually following Thomas and Mackenzie's character, Eloise, or Ellie, a young fashion designer who just got accepted to a school in London, which is also her favorite city in the world. She also very specifically romanticizes the city in the framing of the 1960s. But outside the fun of her dancing around in this like very Cruella-esque dress, there's clearly something else going on with Ellie when she gets a glimpse of her mother in a mirror. But her mom's been dead for years, you end up finding out that she took her own life. So you kind of get the idea that this isn't something that's new, especially when her grandmother starts expressing a concern for her moving to London. I haven't even seen them in ages. So maybe not off to the best start here, but she makes her way off and the illusion of London almost immediately starts scraping away when her uh, cab driver is an utter pervert. Though I will say that was not my experience. London was absolutely fantastic. I loved finding all the landmarks from this movie. It was just so great. Sorry, her illusion starts to shatter the second she gets a pervy cab driver. If all you supermodels are gonna be in Charlotte Street, you'll see plenty of me, don't you worry. And it kind of continues when her roommate Jacinta starts pulling all of like the typical classic mean girl manipulation tactics of trying to one up her stories for sympathy, flipping all the other girls in the dorm on her like typical bitch shit. And instead of putting up with it, Ellie decides she's just gonna get her own place. And the one she finds is perfect for her, her landlady Mrs. Collins hasn't changed the place in decades, which works out just perfect for her sensibilities. Also, yes, that is Diana Rigg. Tell Sassy, I wanted to know it was me. There's slight mention that like a lot of the girls that move there just kind of like leave in the middle of the night. I've had people just take off in the middle of the night, that's why. I would never do that.
Don't worry, there is still the Edgar Wright comedic timing in this movie. But something strange happens the second she goes to bed. She's immediately transported to the Soho area of London in the 1960s, where she finds herself in the life of Sandy, aka Anya Taylor-Joy, who really just pulls these classic vibes off so well. And this is absolutely my favorite scene of the movie where Edgar Wright just shines through completely. It's so dynamic and creative, you're basically just following through as the two are mirrored, but it's being filmed side by side to make it look like a mirror and using twins for characters that are going to be directly reflected. Like the doorman here is played by the Phelps twins, AKA Fred and George Weasley. And Sandy is a fresh face in the big city. She wants to be a famous stage performer and she's willing to do whatever it takes to get there. But whatever it takes might not be as glamorous as it originally seemed. But in this moment, it's electric when she offers to give Jack, this apparent local talent manager, a demonstration of her dancing. Oh my God, this fucking scene. The way they have Anya Taylor-Joy and Thomas and Mackenzie weaving in and out of the dance is just so good and incredibly well done. Like when I talk about this, I feel like Ryan Gosling talking about jazz music in La La Land. Cinema, unironically. According to Wright, there's only one scene that used any kind of digital effects. It's when he's pulling Anya towards him and she morphs into Thomason. The rest is just good editing and repetition and completely relies on the actors being that in sync and consistent with everything that they're doing. It's just repeating the same moves over and over again until you get the ones that work together but like obviously Matt Smith is in focus like the entire time so it has to be very consistent ah and then you just kind of like pull some Texas switches I love it and this scene does exactly what it's supposed to it draws you in just as much as it draws in Ellie it's magnetic alluring pulling you into the fantasy but even if you don't care about the 60s this scene is stunning and the longer it runs the more you're hypnotized like us as the audience are supposed to feel like Ellie is actually experiencing this through Sandy's body and you absolutely do to the point that the scene almost feels like Fight Club-esque Sandy is everything Ellie wants to be a glamorous beautiful girl from the 60s who seems destined to achieve her dreams in like the greatest era era in existence, according to her. So alluring that she immediately gains the attention of everyone she walks by, starting an exciting affair with Jack, the local manager who promises to get her on stage that very same week. And suddenly the night is over and Sandy returns home, which also happens to be the exact same room that Ellie lives in. And now Ellie is obsessed. She's designing Sandy's dress, delivering the same lines she did. The least I can do is drive you home. Ah, what's the most? It's the least I can do. What's the most? Blowing off options for real life plans to re-enter her fantasy of a life long gone where Sandy gets her first audition and knocks it out of the park because it's Anya Taylor-Joy. And the more she weaves into this fantasy, the more she starts becoming Sandy. She dyes her hair, buys her clothing, stumbles on landmarks. Oh wait, that's just me. Is driving everything she's doing design wise, but all of these big purchases mean she has to get a job. That will be 375 pounds. Seriously. So she remembers this bar that was hiring and gets the job and almost immediately gets accosted by this old gentleman. My mother's dead. I thought she might be. And it's basically the second this starts happening that the dream starts to crack. Cause Sandy did make it to the stage, but she's not the star and it isn't glamorous. She's a chorus girl in a marionette show that's more about her body than her talents with a crowd of leering men pulling strings. And Ellie is disgusted, not by Sandy, but by the situation. And she tries to escape, but she's locked in as long as she's asleep and it's very quickly winding into a nightmare. A dressing room with a broken girl being pushed to her limits, being carted out for private evenings with men. So quickly doing whatever it takes to make it goes from paying your dues as like a coat girl or cleaning things up to literally having to sell your body because that's the manipulation here she's not there to be the star she's there to be the product the horrifying reality behind the curtains of girls crying doing drugs falling apart while men wait for their chances to jump tragically the more broken the more they like it this is the seedy underbelly of the romanticization of that era and time of life the flip side of the entertainment coin and we see the direct effect on ellie the more she's tortured at night the more it seeps into her days which which obviously starts concerning the people around her. Her mom couldn't handle the city and killed herself. And Ellie's grandmother is obviously uh, super worried that something's gonna happen to her. And that creep from the bar is back, talking about how he's always made it his habit to know the local girls and that he has a reputation of being a ladies man. Man's like an octopus. Carol says he was the right ladies man back in the day. Clearly trying to set up in the audience mind that this is like Jack the manager as an old man, but I felt that was too obvious. And before long, she's literally dragged back into the nightmare, watching Sandy go through a rotation of men, a different name every night, until she gets to the point where she's drinking so much to drown it out that she's even losing the will to be pissed. Until she hits a guy that seems to be a cop. Someone who still seems pretty skeevy, but I guess he cares. And while he's trying to reason her out of this, she sees Jack from afar with a new target. But maybe you should speak to Jack in the meantime. Jack? He manages a lot of girls. 
Jack is clearly someone who preys on the dreams and the desperation of these young girls and convinces them that this is what it takes to make it, but it's just a place for them to die. And I really like how this scene plays out, Sandy not being willing to look in the mirror and see what she's become while Ellie is just desperately trying to make her look and see that it's not too late. But of course it is. This is the past. But the desperation of her just pounding on the glass until she breaks through to give her a hug is just... I love it. And even when Ellie thinks she's safely back in her room, this is just where the horror starts. Silhouettes of all the men morphing together into these ghostly figures, singular blobs that start moving their way towards the bed like pervy zombies. Every time the light outside clicks a different outfit on Sandy. So good. Just cinema. Though I will say, I don't know how I feel about the design choice for the pervy men and I feel like that's part of why I end up feeling like lackluster about like as it's moving into its conclusion. Like I really dig the idea of what the scene is going for and the idea that all these men just start becoming these like amorphous amalgamations of like different faces and people. But there's just something about them that I don't find menacing and I think that hurts it. And this is also just where things start to lose a little bit of steam. I think that this kind of like horror is a little bit out of Edgar Wright's like regular wheelhouse. Because he's done horror but it's always like comedy horror and not like something that's genuinely supposed to scare you and I, I think that like the themes going on here and like the implications are horrifying I just wish that there had been a way to like I guess I don't know translate that better to the screen and maybe I'm just in the minority there but I do absolutely love the way that this is just seeping into every part of Ellie's life but quickly it went from this amazing boost of joy every day to a literal waking nightmare she dreads sleep things from these dreams start spilling over into reality and I haven't really mentioned this guy named John but he's another fashion student that seems to really like her even though she is barely giving him anything back but he He's sweet and invites her to a Halloween party because he can tell she's struggling. But at the party, it is uh, very strongly suggested that Jacinta drugged Ellie's drink. Like Ellie's already seeing things when she's awake and like she got a hickey after that first dream. So clearly there's some things that seem to have already been physically manifesting. But from this point on, the things she sees outside of her dreams seem like way more intense and way more intrusive on her daily life. Like you don't see Jacinta do anything, but it is heavily implied and Ellie even thinks back to it later when somebody suggests that that she might have been drugged. And I can't see another reason for Jacinta to give them drinks after being all like mischievous looking because she hates Ellie. Also, yes, they did go as the craft. And it's not long after she drinks it that she sees a full manifestation of Sandy at that Halloween party, followed by a chorus of monstrous amorphous men. I also just love the lighting cues here. Cause like, even if it doesn't immediately feel like Edgar Wright, there's just these little style choices that you're like, uh-huh. And it all just really boils over when she takes John back to her place cause she doesn't want to sleep. So they're gonna have a little bit of fun. But it's a disaster waiting to happen because because Mrs. Collins' biggest rule is no boys. And just as they're starting to get to business, Ellie starts seeing Sandy being murdered by Jack. And now she believes that old Hansy here from the bar is actually Jack. Because he starts saying cryptic stuff about knowing all the girls and he has like a reputation of being a Hansy ladies man. And for whatever reason, he just won't leave her alone. So she goes to the cops to report the murder, who obviously feels she is unwell. You witnessed the murder last night, but you believe this was a vision from the past. And potentially suffering from the effects of being drugged, which probably, but still. So she decides to look into murders from like the mid to late 1960s herself. And you may have noticed something in all the newspapers she's looking at, but I'm gonna touch on that later. But John, this absolute angel after almost being murdered by a landlady, goes to check on her and agrees to help her look through hundreds of newspapers like this dude. He doesn't try to make her feel crazy or less than he is. It's so cute. Like, I don't know if I almost got killed the night before, I might be like a little bit hesitant here, but like, you know, it's like he's a little angel. This is just one year. London's a bad place. The absolute shift from where she was just weeks ago, the illusion of the city has just completely melted away. But then the phantom men reappear in the library. It's pretty chilling actually, if they had felt more menacing, this scene would have been terrifying, but she goes to stab one, but it's Jacinta, who definitely doesn't deserve to die, but absolutely deserved that fright. So at this point, Ellie is really losing grip on reality. She's being grabbed at in the streets, trying so desperately to get to Sandy until she's slammed down in the rain, just in time to see who she believes is Jack and finally confronts him. And he did know who Sandy was and felt like he was someone who looked out for all the girls back then. But you know, at the end of the day, you all look the same on the slab. So Ellie still thinks that this is Jack, but it is pretty obviously the cop that Sandy talked to that one time. But it doesn't matter because he gets hit by a car. His name's not Jack. No, love. That's Lindsay. So she finally decides that it might be time to leave London, so John takes her to get her stuff. You look like you've had a fright. I need your help. 
So it turns out the nicer of those two cops showed up to talk to Mrs. Collin about what might be going on with Ellie and the fact that she thinks that a girl might have died there. And this is where things start being revealed to the audience that doesn't quite click in with Ellie. Like there's a porcelain dancer in Mrs. Collins' room that is the same one that uh, Sandy had on her dresser. And the big one is that every letter is addressed to an Alexandra Collins, which was Sandy's full name. What's Sandy short for? Alexandra. So Sandy isn't dead. She got the upper hand on Jack. I put a knife in him. And decided she wasn't gonna let these men continue to take from her. They send me to hell. So? I sent them to theirs. Which is where I will direct your attention back to Ellie going through all those news articles that didn't have anything about a girl dying, but every page she looked at had something about a man mysteriously going missing. Sandy's victims. Look, it might not all come together clean, but I love that. A girl did die up there, I suppose. And it really does just dive into the idea of how people dissociate from themselves in these types of situations. Being a whore is a bit like being an actress, I suppose. I pretend I was somewhere else. This wasn't happening to me. And it's heartbreaking and horrifying and you feel so bad, but yes, she is a murderer. She's literally in the process of killing Ellie right now, hoping to play it off as a troubled girl's suicide. Though I gotta say, if I had a bunch of bodies stored in the walls, like I probably wouldn't want to bring cops around for any kind of death, but okay. But there were some fun clues throughout the movie. Her saying she lived there when she was younger until she was able to buy it from the old landlord. The comment about the smells rising up in the summer, it is the dead bodies in the wall. But then you have to keep the plugs in because all the smells rise up. Then the smaller comments of like no men being allowed. And the movie in general is quite trippy, but it really peaks here. John comes to check on her, he gets stabbed, the house catches fire, and Ellie is just desperately crawling her way up the stairs as Mrs. Collins slips back and forth between being her younger self on a glamorous staircase and Diana Rigg walking up these stairs that are quickly being engulfed in flames. So she gets in the room to make an emergency call from the phone and immediately gets swarmed by the amorphous smoke creepers. And again, really like what they were conceptually just kind of wish they maybe looked a little bit different. I don't know, like they, they are creepy, but I don't know, there's just something, something. But they're not trying to hurt her. They're actually just asking her to kill Sandy so they can be free. Their pain is trapped in this house with Sandy and they're terrified. But even though Sandy is currently trying to kill her, she still thinks all these guys suck and are the reason why she's the way she is because like obviously she would think that and it's years of pain being brought to the forefront. You were the one who wanted this. I didn't want any of this. They deserved it. These men just using women they knew were being forced into it. So the house goes up in flames and Sandy stays behind. It's too late to save the girl she was, but Ellie can still save herself. And she does, she pulls things around, stays in London and finishes her designs, which have taken on a more modern style with inspiration from the past. And her mom is always with her, but so is Sandy. So what's the deal here? So the idea that's kind of going on in this story is that there's like different interpretations of what like ghosts and spirits are and like what like a haunting would be. And the most common is obviously just like trapped souls that might get stuck somewhere to haunt. But this movie is approaching it from the trapped energy standpoint. That locations can contain the energy of like events and people who have both lived and died there, whether they're dead or not. If this place is haunted by anything, it's the good times. Every gangster. Every copper has been in here. And all those high spirits have soaked into the walls. So this is all actually playing into something known as the stone tape theory, which is all about how highly emotional and often traumatic events can be recorded onto physical items and replayed, that the psychic energy release gets left behind, and in this case, trapped in the walls. So these ghosts aren't really spirits of the dead, it's their pain and Sandy's trauma recorded. And the audio completely plays into that, just rippling out from people as it reverberates from the past. <laughs> And that some people are just way more sensitive to those energies and Ellie is one of those people. She's so sensitive to them that like, if it's powerful enough, it engulfs her. So much happened in that room, so much hope, so much glamor, so much pain. So quickly fading to the disgust and broken dreams before Sandy snaps and takes it all out on the men that used her. All that energy stayed trapped in the wall along with the bodies. So that's why Sandy didn't have to be dead for Ellie to be haunted by her past. And I really love that. I think it's such a unique take on like the haunted house. That even though Sandy isn't dead, it's just the energy of what she experienced and the things that happened to her that are just lingering so powerfully over the years. It wakes Ellie up to how the strongest and most confident people can be manipulated by those around them with the false promise of achieving their dreams until they break. Which then all kind of blends into the romanticization of eras long gone. And the darkness that can come from that nostalgia and how people can get caught up thinking that like different eras were perfect when every era has its upsides and its downsides. By propping up the glitz and the glam or talking about how much better the old days were, you're missing the reality of the seed 
the underbelly that trapped so many young people then and continues to this day. And that's not to say we throw the whole thing out and lose any kind of appreciation for the past, but it's just important to remember that there's two sides to every coin and you're here now, so that's where you have to be. So yeah, lots of fun layers here, lots of little hints, great visuals, a stellar first act, and while the last little bit didn't hit quite as hard for me personally, it's still loaded with super interesting filmmaking and a unique take on a genre that's been tackled so many times, while weaving in timeless elements that still inspire and horrify us to this day. So that is gonna do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys were thinking of Last Night in Soho down below. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you wish for more? Did it surprise you? Thanks so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I will have my other social medias listed down below if you wanna follow me there. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.